very, very, you know, obvious because the uh, kid is suffering from the breeze uh, and cannot breathe properly. So some muscles, they are not working properly. That's why the cry uh, signal would be very different from the normal ones. So they use it as another indication for the asphyxiated kids. So we can see that the pediatrician use it and it's some research that shows that actually after two hours of listening with the trained nurses or pediatricians, they can always discriminate between normal and pathological crops. How good they are in discriminating between different pathologies is another story. They might not be very good between different pathologies, but they would certainly say that this infant cry is not normal. So can we really say the same thing as well or not? So the research that uh, has been done in previous probably two, three months would uh, focus on the overview of the nature of relationship between physiological and acoustical aspect of the cry. How we can conclude from some acoustic properties that this infant has some certain pathologies. Okay, so uh, as I said, crying is really the primary mode for infants to uh, expose themselves to express their physical and psychological and physiological needs. Uh, and pediatricians were really, really successful in recognizing those kind of clues. But how good we are. So I want you to listen to these two and say if you really uh, see any difference. This is a normal infant. Yeah. I think I have to. model, which has been introduced by Globes a long time ago. So he was actually an electrical engineering student at the time of uh, doing his PhD, but he had lots of collaboration with physiologists and also psychologists. So what he said is that, okay, uh, let's incorporate two different theories. One of them is acoustic theory of speech production, which is the source filter modeling. We all know about source filter modeling. And the other one is the physiological hypothesis that indicates how larynx and, larynx and vocal tract muscles are controlled for infants. So if we can incorporate both of them in one model, then we can find out how this anatomical relationship 
will be established with the acoustic manifest manifestation of that. So what he said again is that we have three different processors in an infant. So if you look at this page, you would see that this is the central nervous system of the infant. So central nervous system of the infant is actually controlling all of different muscles and activities of the infant. Some of the activities are middle processor, like swelling, heart rate, coughing, respiration, bowel movement, and crying. Now, this middle, this CNS, or central nervous system, controls the crying of the baby and all the muscles that they are actually inside that process. But crying itself would be separated or would be break down into three different parts. Subglottal or respiratory system, which determines the energy of the cry. So depending how this respiratory system or vital capacity of the baby is different from the other one, the energy of the cry would be different. Then we have the glottal, which is larynx, like the uh, human adult. And then we have supraglottal, which is filter or vocal tract and nasal tract. It's also assumed that central nervous, central nervous system is actually controlling each of these three parts independently. So if we have one abnormalities in each of them, it could be reflected in the cry signal individually and independently. That's why we can always relate the cry signal manifestation or the acoustic parameters to the cause of that, where it comes from. So if you look at that one, actually I couldn't find a baby's kind of, you know, <laughs> muscles here, so I use the adult speech, but it's actually ha what's happening here. So what he added to the speech, uh, to the cry production model is the subglottal part, which determines the pressure of the cry, how intense the cry is. And from that part, then all of the other movements or the muscles would be also determined. So the glottal is what we have in the human adult, and we call it source. And the supraglottal is, again, what we have it, and we call it vocal tract or the filter model. So you can see that the middle processor crying is actually divided into three parts, which are lower processors. And then from this lower processor, we can somehow extract some useful information. Okay. Another mm, very interesting point is that in adult speech, we have voice and unvoice. We are very familiar with voice part, unvoice part, how do you take that? In the infants, no, we don't have such a thing. We have different, let's call it phonemes or three different cry types of, or modes. One of them is phonation or basic cry. Phonation is the most rhythmic pattern in the infant cry. You can see actually a very, very nice pitch harmonics in the cry. And the fundamental frequency usually is between 250 and 700 hertz. This phonation is the part which is turbulence part, and it's not periodic, it's something like unvoiced or random noise. So we cannot detect any kind of uh, fundamental frequency in that area. We have another mode, which is hyperphonation. This hyperphonation is what makes the infant cry so different from the speech that we hear. Because this part has very, very sharp increase or decreasing intensity, it has very large shift from or to high pitch. And usually the pitch or the fundamental frequency is over 1,000 hertz in that area. So you, when sometimes you know, you, uh, when you listen to a baby crying or something like that, you get annoyed very quickly because some hyperphonation part, they have very, very uh, high fundamental frequencies. Now, let's see what we really can tell from different glottal, subglottal, and supraglottal part. 